Good afternoon, and you're very welcome. I'm Alex White, Director General of the Institute of International European Affairs, and it's great to welcome you to this afternoon's uh, webinar, which is part of the Rethink Energy series uh, co-organized by ourselves at the Institute and the ESB. And we're delighted to be joined uh, today from Brussels by Ms. Ditta Yul Jorgensen, who's Director General for Energy at the European Commission. Ms. Jorgensen became Director General for Energy uh, on the 1st of August uh, 2019. That capacity, she leads the Director Generalate in its efforts to ensure access to affordable, secure, reliable and clean energy for all Europeans, to promote efficient production and use of energy and to drive the process of becoming the first climate neutral continent whilst contributing to Europe's sustainable growth and job creation. Before assuming her current role, uh, Ms. Jorgensen served in a wide variety of roles in the Commission, including Head of Cabinet for Commissioner Margrethe Westerger, and she also has held the headship of the uh, head of unit position and director positions in the Directorate General, Generalate for, can never get that right, Directorate General for Trade. So it's terrific to have such a distinguished speaker with us this afternoon. Um, Ms. Jorgens is going to um, speak to us for about 20 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes, uh, and then we go to um, a Q&A. You can join that discussion and you can ask a question uh, using the Q&A, usual Q&A function there on Zoom. Give your name and affiliation if you don't mind, if you are asking a question. Um, always good to know who we have and whether you have an organization that you're representing. You can start sending the questions in anytime you like. So if something occurs to you, even at the beginning of the talk, you can put the question in and it'll be there for us um, when we when Ms. Jorgensen has finished uh, her presentation. And just a reminder that the presentation and the Q&A today are both on the record. Before um, Ms. Jorgensen addresses you, I'm delighted to invite um, Paddy Hayes, Chief Executive of the ESB, and our collaborator, our close collaborator for this event and indeed all of this series of events. Um, um, and it's uh, great to have you with us, Paddy. I know you're going to um, take the opportunity maybe to say a few words and please do that and then uh, we'll get going with our, uh, with our webinar. Thank you so much. Paddy. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Alex, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, we're really pleased to be associated with the Rethink Energy Lecture Series in the with the IIEA. And uh, it's my great pleasure to add my welcome to Alex's and to welcome you to, to today's lecture on behalf of the ESP. And um, particularly warm welcome from us to our guest speaker, Dieter Yul Jorgensen, who's, uh, as Alex said, uh, Director General for DGNR. It's a really important role, and uh, Director General, we're we're honoured to have you with us today, and to be able to listen to your insights. Um, before I say anything else, I'd just like to acknowledge the impact that Storm Debbie has had on many of our customers in Ireland this morning. Um, I hope that um, those of you joining us haven't been affected, and um, I know that. Uh, well, I can assure you that the ESB Networks crews are working to restore electricity across the country as safely and as quickly as possible. And uh, I know a number of people will be aware that recently ESP Networks was um, very pleased to be able to support our European colleagues from Enedis in France uh, to help restore supply in Brittany after the aftermath of Storm Kieron. Um, so lots of challenging times, uh, specifically at the moment in the in the electricity sector, may be driven by, by climate, but more generally the past two years have been an incredibly challenging time for the electricity sector in Europe. And um, we know that the European Commission and particularly the uh, Energy Directorate has done really excellent work to protect customers, to support energy security and to, uh, notwithstanding the, the challenges, to continue to drive the energy transition. Uh, the Repower EU plan has set Europe on a faster trajectory away from imported fossil fuels and continuing the direction towards a more sustainable future, as well as helping to, to stabilise energy prices in Europe. Uh, this year, and that's been really critically important. Um, in ESP, we appreciate that zero carbon electricity is a necessity for a climate neutral economy. Um, we know that developing and connecting low carbon generation and renewables is a key to reducing the carbon intensity of electricity. We understand that helping our customers to use that increasingly clean, low carbon electricity and heat and transport in industry, doing that in a competitive way is a key to decarbonizing our economy and hitting our climate goals. 
but we also know that it won't be easy. It hasn't been easy so far. And it's getting more challenging as we're having to, as we're trying to move further and faster. The rate of annual emission reductions delivered over the past decade probably needs to more than double in the years ahead so that we achieve a 55% reduction by 2030. So it really is a time for delivery. And we get that sense. I was in Brussels last week. We really get that sense from Europe that it's a time for delivery now. And having clear, coherent, ensuring policy frameworks at European national level isn't just very helpful in this regard it's an absolute necessity and that shared clarity and purpose and determination in the face of an uncertain future it really is supportive of the innovation we need around new technologies and it really helps to facilitate the sort of investment and the implementation and delivery that's going to be absolutely necessary and essential for securing the secure and sustainable energy future and so I'm really grateful to the IAEA for setting up this lecture series and particularly to the Director General of uh, DGNR uh, for taking the time to share our insights today. And ladies and gentlemen, then um, I just uh, give you Dieter Jewell Jorgensen, who's the Director General of DGNR. Over to you, Dieter. Thank you very much uh, and, uh, um, and greetings to everyone from Brussels. I think what you have just said, Paddy, about uh, Storm Debbie and the impact on the energy sector really is a very good example of the challenges we see in relation to energy and climate uh, and, and making sure that we have secure access to energy across the European Union. So I think a very timely uh, event today. Thank you very much to the IA, um, EA for having organized it and for having invited me. It's an honor to be here uh, with you this, uh, this afternoon. And um, what I would like to do um, over this coming hour is to set out, uh, first of all, our energy policy. What is what is the policy we're building towards uh, climate change, towards climate neutrality uh, and the green transition that is necessary to achieving that? But also, of course, how have we handled the energy crisis that is still ongoing across the European Union and, and really a global crisis? Um, in doing that, I have three main points. The first one is the European Green Deal that was established in 2019 as our main policy objective. Really, how do we put all of our policy instruments together to work towards climate neutrality in 2050? Um, and also, how has that agenda actually been reinforced by uh, the crisis we have seen following the Russian invasion into Ukraine through our Repower EU plan? And that links into my second point, uh, which is how have we responded to this global energy crisis that really had its epicenter in Europe? And how have we made sure that our response aligns with the green transition and with the European uh, Green Deal? Um, and my third point is that all of this, of course, takes place in a global environment in and in, in an important geopolitical challenging set of circumstances. And I think international cooperation is absolutely necessary for us to achieve our goals, both when it comes to climate and when it comes to energy security. And so my last and third, my third and last point will be about the international cooperation. And of course, looking ahead to COP28, which will start in just a few weeks uh, from now. So on the first point, the Green Deal, that really has been our main priority uh, since 2019, since the last election to the European Parliament just four years ago. How do we best ensure climate neutrality by 2050? And of course, we in the European Union cannot alone address climate change, but we can do a lot already to lower emissions within the European Union, and we can do a lot to help uh, strengthen that work also at global level to help respect our target our threshold for not going above 1.5 degrees Celsius as agreed in the Paris Agreement. Um, and we're not actually on track. We need to do a lot more. And so the focus is indeed on implementation and on making things happen. So in the European Green Deal, we have put together all of the different policy instruments that can contribute to climate change mitigation, to lowering greenhouse gas emissions. And we have agreed that we should lower greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% in 2030. What we have shown over the last years is that we can actually grow our economy, increase our GDP, GDP while we lower greenhouse gas emissions. So it is possible. What we also know is that about two thirds of greenhouse gas emissions come from the energy sector, either from production of energy or from consumption of energy. And so in other words, in order to significantly lower our greenhouse gas emissions, we really have to transform our energy system. Um, so that is what, uh, what we're working on here together with the 27 uh, member states in the European Union. 
Um, we are doing it through a package of measures, we call it Fit for 55, that really aims to, to build the best possible regulatory framework to incentivize and facilitate the change that is necessary in the energy system so that we make sure that all Europeans have access to affordable, secure and clean green energy. And we do that by updating our renewables energy directive, setting targets for renewable energy. We do that by updating our energy efficiency directive, setting targets and measures for being more energy efficient and make better use of the energy we have. And um, for example, in relation to buildings with the energy performance of buildings directive. We also do it by clarifying rules around hydrogen, green hydrogen as a new energy carrier, and, and by clarifying the rules for a decarbonized gas market, as well as reducing methane emissions that are related to the energy sector. Um, and there's a lot more there, but it's a very, very long list. But what I can assure you is that we are taking action really across all policy areas to achieve climate neutrality in 2050 with a 55% reduction by 2030. Now, um, my second point relates to the energy crisis and how we have responded to that. And as I said, our response to the energy crisis has actually reinforced um, the work that we're doing to transform our energy system and to achieve climate neutrality. So um, Russia invaded Ukraine on the 24th of February 2022, and it quickly became very clear that one of the impacts of that for the European Union specifically was in the energy sector, because we had been highly dependent on Russia and especially on Russian fossil gas for our energy and energy security across the European Union. So in March 2022, just a few weeks after the invasion by Russia, we adopted what we call the Repower EU plan that aims to reduce quickly um, our dependence on Russian fossil fuels in our energy system and, and align with, of course, with our Green Deal objectives. Um, and to give you the numbers, to give you the context, we were dependent before the war on Russian fossil gas for 45% of our total consumption, and we needed to bring that down by two thirds by the end of 2022. So quite an ambitious target that we set for ourselves, but a necessary one given the context of the Russian war in Ukraine and the lowering Russian supplies to the European Union. So the Repower EU plan builds on three pillars. The first one is to reduce our consumption. And essentially we know that there are many things that are not in our control. We cannot control supply from others. And we cannot control the demand in other important markets. The Chinese demand is out of our control, but we can control our own energy demand and our own energy savings. And so the first target really was to lower our energy demand, uh, reducing energy, being more energy efficient, putting in place savings, so as to lower the, um, lower the dependence on Russia, but of course also to mitigate the climate change impact that we see from our, from our energy system. Now, in addition to energy savings, uh, we've also decided under Repower EU to accelerate the deployment of renewable energy in the European energy system. So to essentially accelerate the Green Deal, accelerate the rollout of renewable energy so that these renewable energy sources can replace the fossil sources as much and as quickly as possible. And then the third pillar is that we still need molecules in the system. We still need some fossil molecules in the system. We don't yet have enough clean energy sources to cover all of our demand. And so to the extent we still use molecules, we um, set out a plan to diversify so that we would not be as dependent on any one supplier, but really uh, be safer in a, in a more diversified global market. And of course, replace the fossil molecules by cleaner molecules wherever that is possible, such as biomethane, which is an important, uh, an important substitute, and of course, green hydrogen. Um, and so how did we do that? Well, we took a number of specific emergency measures, but we also agreed to strengthen our ambition, to increase our ambition when it comes to energy efficiency and renewables targets. And that has now been agreed by two co-legislators, the 27 member states and council, and of course the European Parliament. So we now have a target for renewable energy of 42.5% in 2030, with an aim, with a non-binding aim for 45%, which goes beyond what we had originally proposed. And throughout this first year of the crisis, the winter of 22 and going into 23, 24, uh, into 22-23, we achieved um, a significant number of milestones and we're now much better placed, much better prepared for going to this next winter in what is a continued energy crisis. 
First of all, as I mentioned, demand reduction. The measures we took there have been efficient and we have lowered our demand for natural gas by 18% over the first year of the measures. Uh, and this year we are on, on track to a, be above 21% savings, a 21% saving compared to the preceding five years. Um, so we have extended our energy savings measure um, and that should save us about 60 billion cubic meters of natural gas a year. And again, to put these 60 billion cubic meters into context, our overall consumption before the crisis was 400, 400 billion cubic meters. So 60% is quite a significant share of that. Out of the 400 billion cubic meters, about 155 billion cubic meters came from Russia. We have significantly reduced that share. So going below the 45% that we had before the war to about 24% in 2022. And now in 2023, in the first eight months of the year, and we saw about 15% Russian share in our, in our gas system. So a significant reduction in line with our Repower U objectives. And what we've managed to do is to replace that Russian gas with other sources. Now, uh, most importantly, as I said, we have reduced our demand. So quite a significant share is simply not replaced. We've reduced demand or using cleaner sources such as renewable energy. Um, and where we still need fossil gas in the system, and we still do, we can now see, we have now benefited from a significant increase in pipeline supplies from Norway and other, non, and other uh, suppliers in the region. And then we have seen a very, very significant increase in the import of liquid natural gas, LNG, it goes from about 70 billion cubic meters before the war to about 117 billion cubic meters last year. And here, uh, so that's an increase of 73%, with US being the main supplier, uh, up very, very significantly over these past few years. Now, I know that you in Ireland have not been significantly dependent on Russian gas. You don't have these pipeline connections that countries in, uh, in continental Europe and Central and Eastern Europe ha have. Um, but, um, but you have nonetheless in Ireland also carried out a significant effort to reduce, uh, our, to reduce consumption and help diversify. Uh, and that has been important both for your energy security, but, but of course also for the overall objectives um, within Europe. Um, I mentioned that um, an important pillar of our work on Repower EU was to accelerate the installment and the deployment um, of renewable energy. And 2020 EU, thanks to all of these efforts across the European Union, really became a record year. We installed 58 gigawatt uh, of renewable additional, uh, and that represents about 12 billion cubic meters of the gas that we wanted to, to save. So quite an important dent in the fossil consumption that, uh, that this additional renewable energy has given. This has mainly been uh, solar, that has been the quick and easy one to install, but also additional wind. And so we saw these two sources, wind and solar, representing 22% of the overall electricity in the European Union. And for the first time ever, uh, presenting a higher, representing a higher share than natural gas. We expect in this year that new renewable will be even more. We expect to go to about 69 gigawatt, which would be an additional 13, 13 billion cubic meters of, of natural gas. So again, this accelerated deployment of renewables really has helped replace natural gas in the system. And this should continue over the coming uh, decade and beyond. If I may say a few words about how Ireland has fared in this uh, and how Ireland has approached it, um, and I would like to, to, to do that because Ireland has actually brought very impressive action um, over these last year, clearly demonstrating a commitment to decarbonizing the economy and the energy system, both setting sectoral carbon budgets, but also upgrading the national renewable electricity target to 70%, and then further up to 80% by 2030. So a very ambitious objective um, on which we uh, congratulate you. These plans are in line with the common targets, they even go ahead of those, go beyond those ambitions. Um, and I know that there's a fairly tight, time, fairly tight time frame to deliver these targets that will require us all to accelerate and simplify the permitting procedures and making sure that the overall systems are really fit and in place for managing these very large shares of renewable energy, intermittent energy into the electricity systems. 
Um, we have done what we can at the European Union to address some of those challenges, but as Paddy also said at the opening, further efforts to implement, to make things actually happen on the ground, that is where the focus is now and what we need to make to make happen. Um, so that brings me to uh, the next steps. We still have a lot of work to do to acclaim our, achieve our climate neutrality target and achieve our targets for 2030. Um, so we still have ongoing negotiations for a lot of the legislative frameworks that we're working on. Um, and we continue that over the, coming, over the coming months, hoping to close by the end of this year or early in the new year. I'll not take you through all of these different legislative proposals and actions, but I would like to mention one that's particularly important uh, across the European Union and also in Ireland. And that is um, our work to renew, to update our electricity market design. So we have a common electricity market across the European Union and with our neighboring countries, and it has brought us energy security, make sure we haven't suffered from blackouts, except in the case of a specific storm or other or other natural uh, um, events. Um, and it has also helped bring us uh, the lowest possible prices across the European Union. But what we've seen during the crisis is that electricity prices were to a large extent driven by the very high natural gas prices. They were what we call the margin setting prices, uh, and they went up and were very volatile, and that impacted electricity prices. Um, so we can see that that has been a problem for European households, European consumers, European businesses. And we can also see that we don't have the best possible, we don't have the, the exact framework to help incentivize further investments into renewables. And so what we have suggested is to uh, review the electricity market design so that we make the energy bills of European consumers and companies more independent from these short-term, very volatile uh, market developments that we've seen resulting from the high high gas prices. Uh, and we have also we are also in the review trying to make sure that it is easier to accelerate the deployment of renewables and phase out gas, uh, including by an improvement of consumer rights and protections and by creating a stable and predictable framework for investments and overall better consumer protections. So this uh, electricity market design is currently under discussion between the co-legislators, the council and the parliament, and we hope to see um, agreement over the coming over the coming months. A lot more is ongoing. One of the concerns we have had in relation to the high energy prices is, of course, how will it impact households? What is the social impact of that? How do we secure a just transition? But also, how does it impact our businesses and the competitiveness of the European Union? So we have taken a number of measures to strengthen European competitiveness, also in this time of high prices and energy crisis across the European Union, including with the Green Deal Industrial Plan, with a Net Zero Industrial Act to underpin our industrial manufacturing of the key technologies in the European Union and a critical raw materials to make sure that we have the stable supply chains that we need. And very recently, we presented a European Wind Power Action Plan uh, just a few weeks ago to address the challenges that the wind sector, the wind industry is currently facing across the European Union, despite the fact that we are deploying renewables and that we have ambitious targets. It's been difficult for the sector, and so we've put in place a, a set of actions to really facilitate easing the permitting constraints, improving the auction systems, helping to de-risk and provide access to finance, and help uh, establish a level playing field globally. And that brings me to my last point, the global action, because in addition to the global action of our action for global competitiveness and, and global level playing field, as I mentioned, we need international partnerships to achieve climate neutrality going into COP28, and we also need international partnerships for our energy security. So COP28 that will take place in the United Arab Emirates at the end of this month is really a critical moment for our fight for climate neutrality and, and for being able globally to respect the 1.5 degrees Celsius target that was agreed with the Paris Agreement. And right now we are not on track. We're not on track globally. We need to do a lot more. And so for the European Union, we are really going into COP28 with a high level of ambition, using the global stock tape to identify the best practices and policies and measures. Uh, how do we dismantle any barriers to the transition? How do we take action to mitigate climate change in addition, of course, to action for adaptation and the financing for loss and damage. Um, as I mentioned before, the energy sector is absolutely critical in addressing the climate challenge. Um, and we therefore have two main initiatives in the field of energy. 
One is a call for a global pledge to triple renewable energy and double energy efficiency improvements by 2030, where we are trying to get as many countries as possible to sign up to this global pledge, which would bring us an additional 11 terawatt of renewable energy by 2030. Um, we also suggest a methane emission reduction. So this is a follow up to what was the global methane pledge just a few years ago in Glasgow, where uh, we uh, commit to taking further action to implement it. There we now have 150 countries that have committed, but we can do more to make it happen. We do it in Europe in our regulatory framework, but also this global framework, this global partnership is critical for that. So COP28 is really an essential moment for our climate uh, to address the climate crisis, but of course also to work with partners on energy and energy security. So the fight against climate change really is a shared global responsibility. It requires action from all of us, both commitment, but also real action on the ground from countries, from governments, from international organizations, from citizens, from companies. Um, and this is also what we see in the European Union. In fact, there was a recent uh, uh, opinion poll across the European Union asking about important topics. And here in Ireland, 79% of people believe that climate change should be a priority for the government. And this reflects the very high priority given to this um, by all citizens across the European Union. And so that is what we're working on in the European Union to make sure there is a better and greener future for all and that all Europeans have access to affordable, green and, um, uh, and secure energy. And with that, uh, thank you very much for having listened to me. I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much um, and for covering such um, considerable territory in those uh, short 20 minutes. Um, and putting us in the picture uh, in terms of your own priorities and those of the Commission. And actually, on that point, um, first question that I have is it keeps to that kind of broad agenda approach. Fergal McNamara, who's the co-chair of our IIEA Climate and Energy uh, Group here at the Institute, he's just saying, well, look, you know, given that there'll be a new College of Commissioners um, by the middle of next year, um, a new parliament, obviously, European Parliament is incoming also next year. Um, what do you foresee as your advice or your to-do list? Uh, what would be the top priorities on that to-do list that you would uh, suggest to the incoming commissioner and, and his or her team? Thank you very much. We are, of course, looking at that. So first of all, the mandate for the incoming uh, commission president and, and commissioners will, of course, be set by the European Council and, and by the European Parliament after the election. So we will see what is the what is what are the outcomes there. But in the field of energy, I think there are just a couple of points that I would like to point to. So um, the first one uh, we've already talked about is that we need to make sure that that uh, everything that, that we bring results. We have a very good regulatory framework now with the Fit for 55 package with all the regulatory upgrades we've done. And now we need to make sure that there is implementation and that we deliver results, that we make things happen. And so I think we really need to focus uh, need to focus on that, securing that there is this regulatory stability and predictability and making the change happen. The second point I would point to is that of competitiveness and um, uh, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has already addressed this very clearly both in her State of the Union and, and in other recent statements, concern that European competitiveness has been impacted by the energy crisis, the high energy prices, uh, together with a number of other uncertainties essentially in global markets and, and in Europe. And so we need to make sure that, that, we, uh, that we reap the economic benefits of the energy transition. Um, the challenges we face is not because of the transition, it's because of the war and the energy crisis and the geopolitical and geoeconomic context. So we need to make sure that we can actually reap the benefits of the, of the energy transition and strengthen our competitiveness, including in the green uh, technology sectors. And then the third point I would mention is the just transition. Um, I think the energy crisis has impacted households across the European Union. And here it's really important that we make sure that everyone again benefits from the transition um, and, and can reap the benefits of what will be cheaper uh, and cleaner energy sources across the European Union. So those are some of the points that I will certainly be making to the to the incoming uh, leadership as, as recommendations. Thank you. Gemma O'Reilly from the National Economic and Social Council um, here in Dublin says noticed that noted that you mentioned the deployment of renewables. Um, allowing the replacement of natural gas. But she's wondering if you would make some um, observations maybe on the phase out of the dirtier fossil, fossil fuels, in particular coal. Um, she's wondering if you'd like to comment on how you see 
the buildings and roads emissions trading system uh, will play out in the energy uh, sector. But anyway, I'm not quite not totally clear on if I've got the second part right. But the first part um, in relation to uh, the dirtier um, the dirtier fossil fuels, coal. Um, would you like to say anything about about that? Yes, so we still, uh, indeed, it's a very, very good question because we still have coal as part of the European energy mix uh, for, for electricity generation. And clearly that has a much higher uh, CO2 impact, a much higher methane emissions, a much more significant impact on, on the climate than, than natural gas does. So the phase out of coal is a priority. Uh, we have agreed uh, among ourselves in the European Union to phase out coal. Different member states have different uh, timeframes for when to achieve the full phase out because it really depends on their national circumstances, how much coal do they have in the system. But we have agreed on a phase out of coal and I think everything we can do to accelerate that phase out that, that should be done. In some cases, that actually means uh, shifting from coal to natural gas power generation. And while natural gas is a, is a fossil energy source and while it has an impact on climate, it's significantly lower than that of coal. So in that context, natural gas is also part of the energy transition and, and will remain part of our, of our energy system. Um, Bill Boucher, Thanks you for your very insightful presentation. Uh, have you any views on the RE100 initiative? Thank you very much for that question, uh, Bill. So I, I assume you mean the initiative to go for 100% uh, renewables in mm -hmm. our in our energy system. And I think there's been a lot of interesting work uh, and analysis going on in relation to renewables 100. Can we, can we run an, a system where renewable um, power generation represents 100%. Um, and I think uh, there's still need, we still need more work uh, on that. Essentially, what we are trying to do now is to increase as much as possible the share of renewables, in particular wind and solar, but also other sources, hydro, geothermal, um, and there are more sources that can come online later. And we need to make sure that we have a system that allows for that as much as possible. And that requires a few things that is also part of what we're working on. First of all, it requires what we would call system integration. So a, a better organization of the overall system so that the different energy uses and energy supplies communicate with each other, if you will. Um, and what I mean by that is that you could have, for example, a data center, which is a very significant user of energy, very energy intensive type industry. Um, and that data center also has a lot of waste heat. And if we, instead of calling that waste heat, were to call it energy that actually comes out because heat is energy as well. If we can use that energy, for example, to heat the homes in the area where this data center is placed, then we've got, then we're integrating different and industry with our heating systems. And that type of system integration is absolutely critical for these higher shares of renewables uh, in our system. The other thing that's going to be necessary is we're going to need much better storage systems than what we have now. We have battery storage for our, for our electricity, but the storage is typically fairly uh, short duration and does not quite have the capacity. So to have more renewable electricity in our power system, we're also going to need improved uh, storage technology and facilities. We need to invest more in that and we need to innovate to have better, to have better technology. So, um, and the third point I wanted to make is, of course, green hydrogen, which is a, a way to both store and transport energy, where we turn the the uh, where we use the electricity to produce molecules that can be used in particular in the sectors that are otherwise hard to abate, such as the energy intensive industries, steel, cement, and others. So just to mention that there are some regulatory. Uh, things we have to put in place, there are some technology, some innovation we have to put in place, there are some systems that we have to put in place in order to allow for much higher renewables, let alone the, the 100%. Um, obviously, the energy mix or the choices in that regard remain very much something that is in the remit of the member states. But uh, uh, Andrew Dunn is wondering whether you think uh, that Germany might reopen nuclear stations in the future or whether, you know, instead of relying on Russian gas or other gas and wondering, um, are there any plans for maintaining or increasing nuclear energy uh, across, you know, across the European Union? But of course, it is it is principally a, 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 a decision for member states themselves, I think, is probably the first answer to that. But what's your view? Indeed, Alex, that would be my first point is that, the, the as you're saying, the energy mix is a national decision. So it's up to each national government whether they 
have nuclear or not in their energy system. So um, under the, the European treaty, the energy mix is national. There are a few exceptions to that in the sense that, for example, we have agreed to phase out coal. It's up to member states to decide over what period of time, but, but there is an agreement. We've also agreed to set ourselves targets for renewable energy. And so within that national decision, there are some common common policy goals that we have set ourselves. But nuclear it really is for each government to decide. The current situation is that about half the governments, half the countries in, in Europe have nuclear as part of their energy mix. And um, so that's the that's the, the legal framework, if you will. Now, um, within that, we have, of course, looked at how do we achieve climate neutrality in 2050? What would the energy mix look like for us to be climate neutral in 2050? And what we can see is that we would need much higher shares of renewables, but also that we would need some nuclear in the system, around 13% of the total energy mix across the European Union. So not in each individual country, but on the whole in the European Union, around 13% of nuclear. Um, so if you translate that, that means uh, a bit more nuclear than what we have today, because we'll have more electricity. Um, and what we see is that most of the member states that have nuclear intend to continue. Some are looking to phase out. Some member states that don't currently have nuclear are looking to invest and establish nuclear, including one of the newer technologies, small modular reactors. And in fact, just last week, a number of meetings took place in, in, in Bratislava in, um, in Slovakia, discussing in the European Nuclear Energy Forum uh, and at an event dedicated to small modular reactors. So there are some technological developments also in the field of nuclear uh, that some of the member states that are investing into nuclear are looking to and where there might be an interest for also from, from a European uh, competitiveness and industrial policy perspective. So quite a lot is happening in that sector as well under European energy policy and under our common, we have a treaty, Eurotum treaty that that frames our work on uh, on nuclear. But again, it's a national decision whether to have it or not. You spoke a good deal about the electricity market and the design of the electricity market. Um, Eddie Wangweo um, has a question where he says, will we reach a point? He's asking whether you think we will reach a point where electricity prices are completely decoupled from gas prices, you know, from high and volatile gas prices. And if so, if you think we will reach that point, over what time frame do you think that might happen? Thank you. Indeed, as um, one of the things we're aiming to do with our electricity market design is to decouple um, as much uh, as possible. And the way we do it is to make sure that a larger part of the electricity comes from um, comes from uh, or is related to longer term stable pricing arrangements such as uh, power purchasing agreements or what we call contract for difference where there is uh, state subsidies or state aid uh, involved um, so that the prices that consumers actually play, pay are, are decoupled. And that's the key point is that the consumer prices are decoupled. So you've got the whole the, the short term wholesale market and that has to link to the different price setting mechanisms. But we need to decouple the consumer prices as much as possible and allow the consumers to sign up to the types of contracts that are not linked to high fossil prices. Um, and when consumers have a choice, that is the effective decoupling that consumers can decide to, to go into a different pricing arrangement. So that I think is uh, will, will be an important development and help for both households and, and companies. Dennis Nocton TD is a former uh, Minister for Energy. Um, uh, in fact, he was my successor in that role. Um, and he's wondering again about the market um, <clears throat> refers to what he describes as the patchwork of electricity distribution networks across the European Union. He says that that's the case and it's limiting the opportunities that might otherwise be there in terms of both supply and price. So his question is, where is the EU plan for the construction of the 11 priority electricity corridors and the timelines for delivery on that? Thank you. Very, very good. Very good question. And I, um, a good opportunity to say something about the both the transmission and distribution networks and, and our overall grids, because um, with our work uh, to become climate neutral and to make better use of the energy we have, we're going to need to electrify to a much higher degree. Not because electrification in itself is a, is a better thing, but because the electrification brings significant energy efficiency. Um, electric vehicles use about less than a third than compared to combustion engines. And the same with heat pumps, significantly more energy efficient than, than, combustion, than uh, sorry, gas, gas boilers. 
and so electrification is an important part of the energy transition. And of course, the more the more electricity we have and the more renewables we have in the system, we also need to invest in grids and make sure that we have the right both transmission and, and distribution systems and infrastructure across the European Union. We will be coming out in just a few weeks with um, a new with an additional action plan specifically on grids looking of course primarily at transmission but also at distribution level because we need to make sure that that investment can take place and that there is again the the, the clarity of what is needed and the predictability for investors so um, that's my first point is that we are taking action under that grid action plan and really look forward to working with member states and transmission and distribution system operators to to make that happen uh, essentially then we, of course, have already a, a good framework for infrastructure and infrastructure investment. We have the regulation on trans-European networks in the field of energy, um, and we have the uh, we have the related financing mechanisms. So the the objectives, the targets, or those investments that have been identified, those projects are are ongoing and will continue to to do what we can to make sure, indeed, that we get a better both transmission and distribution system across the European Union. When we think again about um, renewable energy and all of the work that is ahead in order to expand um, in every country, uh, uh, um, and I know that's something that we're very conscious of here in Ireland, is you know the what, where is the capacity in terms of the skills uh, to develop. At renewable energy, uh, obviously there's supply chains issues that people have been concerned about, but also skills and ensuring that people switch into work in this sector, in that sector. And actually, the ESB, um, I think, has made very considerable strides on this whole issue of skills and training people up and ensuring that we have that we have a good baseline of skills in the country to deliver on the you know very ambitious programs in respect of the development of, of renewable renewable energy infrastructure um both on the wind side solar and then obviously onward to the grill to the grid so there are there are I and mean, this is the european year of skills i think isn't it the europe uh, so what what you know what can the commission do what is the commission doing in relation to trying to expand the skill mix and the skill level of our young people in particular to get into the sector a very, very good point, um, Alex. And as you said, it's the European Year of the Skills, so we really have taken particular action and, and, and paid specific attention to what do we do to develop the skills across the European Union that we will need. It's really about um, it's really about educating the, the the engineers of the future and for the future. Um, and so what we can see is we need to attract more young people into into those educations into those uh, those uh, qualifications that will that will bring uh, people who can help make the make the uh, the transition uh, happen we do that um, in in each of the national uh, um, educational systems uh, but also in 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 common european action under the year of the skills really identifying what are the skills that are needed for the energy transition and how can we make it happen i think one of the interesting points on that is that there's a lot of really interesting jobs in the energy transition a lot of green interesting jobs some of the skills that have been used in the past in other sectors can actually be transferred and be used in the in the energy transition. Um, and so I think one of the challenges for all of us is to look at what are the skills that are already there that can be used also to the green uh, transition, maybe with a bit of reskilling, a bit of an upgrade or, or, or additional training, uh, but a lot of them are, uh, are already there. But I think really the question of skills also speaks very much to a younger generation. What do you want to do? And do you want to become part of of making this change to our to the way we we operate our energy system and our economy so that it becomes greener and, and cleaner and, and helps ch um, address the climate challenge. Would you say a few words about permitting um, generally? I mean, you mentioned it in your presentation. Again, one of the kind of obstacles that a lot of people would see to uh, rapid progress uh, would be the um, constraints um, that exist um, in relation to planning and permitting. Now, of course, that's not to say that citizens don't have the right to object and the right to contribute to 
decisions on on uh, planning within the context of a planning code that a country would have. We were in Germany last week and we had some discussions there and they were talking about some initiatives that are coming forward in that country. If I'm not mistaken, I think they were even musing about the possibility of reducing permitting times down to a period, a short period of months. Um, that's not something that would be familiar to us in this country. Um, so what what can you say anything just generally from the commission's perspective as to what could be as to whether it's important that change is made there or necessary that change is made there? How extensive might that change be? And do you have an idea of, you know, a time frame period that is appropriate to permitting applications in this sector generally? It's a big question, I know. But. Yes, but it really is an important question because indeed we can see that one of the significant obstacles to the deployment of renewables is that it takes a long time to get mm. the permitting process simply takes a long time. Mm. And of course, within that time that it takes, there are a number of different components. Some of them are necessary steps for a good permitting process. You need to make sure that there's transparency. You need to make sure that people in the local community, for example, can be are, are heard, that they have a possibility to, to give their view. You, of course, have to make sure that it's a legally sound process, that it respects environmental rules and, and procedures. So sometimes these things do take time. And what we have to make sure is that they don't take longer than what they have to. And that's the problem now is that it takes far too long in, in most European member states. So um, what we've done at European level is, first of all, we have strengthened the regulatory framework, really putting in place some, some, uh, some, some targets for how long should permitting take. Uh, but then um, I think more importantly, actually identifying what are the issues that lead to this delay? Why does it take so much longer? What member states have been, um, how, how have member states shortened the permitting time? And some member states have really good results. What have they done? What are the best practices? So really to look at the concrete measures we can either take at European level or that national or local authorities uh, can take to help reduce uh, permitting time. Now, one of the questions in, in permitting is always, of course, the how do the different legal frameworks fit uh, together and how does the build out of renewables or infrastructure, how does that fit in an environmental framework? And I think it's quite important to underline that the situation is not one where there is a conflict between environmental law and clean energy infrastructure. On the contrary, our renewables and clean energy infrastructure really contributes to a cleaner environment. So that so there's no there is no conflict there. But what we do see is that there can sometimes be a challenge between different legal procedures. And it is more a question of the procedures and managing that uh, the legal processes than it is about substance. And so to the extent we can address that procedural challenge, we can already do quite a lot to significantly lower the permitting times. I think we need to all take inspiration from those member states that have really lowered very, very significantly to see how exactly have they done it? What is it that can be simpli simplified and, um, and, and facilitated? And I think we need to make sure that there's good engagement with local communities so that people know what is it that is happening. And what we see in some member states is that they have made sure that the local communities could benefit directly from the new renewable energy. So for example, if a new wind turbine is installed close to a town, if the town benefits from the clean and cheaper, much lower cost energy, well, then there might also be a readiness at local level to, to, uh, to, to accept, yes, there is a wind turbine, but it really brings both cleaner air and cheaper energy to the local community. So I think there's a lot more that, that, that can be done. A lot of that is set out in our wind power action plan that I mentioned before, that we will now be discussing both with governments and with the sector. And it may be that the licensing and permitting uh, regimes for offshore uh, wind might be more amenable to a, a kind of a standardized approach um, than, than onshore, because of course there are different legal traditions and different constraints and so on that apply. But I wonder, do you think that in the offshore context that there's a chance there to have perhaps, you know, quite a standardized approach um, at the European level, given that it's, you know, it's the seas around Europe. Well, at least I think there's, I, I think there's a very good point you're raising. And I think at least there are certain, uh, certainly a number of commonalities across different offshore wind projects. What we look at there is um, maritime sea planning and how do you manage in a sustainable way the sea basins. And most of the maritime areas where we will be deploying or where member states will be deploying offshore wind of course, also 
um, they're also home to many other different either industries of, or activities. It can be uh, uh, sea transport, it can be uh, defense, it can be obviously infrastructure that's there, it's fishermen, it can be tourism, it's the whole, it's the whole uh, sea basin, the, the sustainable, the, 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 um, the uh, f how do you say, flora and fauna, the animals that yes. live there. So there's a lot, a lot that benefit from these sea basins. And there I think we can do quite a lot in, in, in maritime spatial planning and really finding the best sustainable approaches to to doing that but as you said a lot of that that is common to most of the areas so is other things that we can that we can do together and i think that's a very very good point point. Mm. and you mentioned uh, dara lawler who's a senior researcher here at the institute um says that recalls you mentioning when you in your presentation you know the importance of not being dependent on one supplier and how that was seen to be such a critical question last year um you know that the argument being that Europe um, had failed perhaps to anticipate the scale of its dependence on on Russian gas, uh, or, or 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 as to what would be done if there was any kind of a crisis in that regard. And Dara is just wondering, and I think it's an interesting question: do, do you think there are dependencies, other dependencies that Europe has today that should similarly concern us from the point of view of geopolitical risk? And one thinks of the whole raw materials debate, the whole I issues in relation to. Um, in, in particularly in the in the whole battery um, scene and uh, access to the necessary materials, uh, there lithium and, and and so on, and some concerns in in uh, uh, by commentators that there are going to be issues there. Yes, absolutely. I think it's a very very good point. When we look at our our competitiveness, then um, the 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 security of the supply chains and the access to critical raw materials in particular really are of concern. What we see in the area of critical minerals, critical raw materials, is that one particular country, China, has a very strong presence both in the extraction through investments elsewhere, but even more importantly in the processing uh, and in the in the input in the components that 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 make up for batteries, which will be um, a critical part. Of critical component for our energy transition and for our electrification. So that very high level of dependence on one supplier is of concern. And what we are doing about it at, at European level is really a number of things. I mentioned earlier that we have made a, a proposal for a legal act, a critical raw materials act that aims to diversify and make sure that the investments that are needed also in Europe take place so that we can build a higher level of, of, of independence, not complete self-sufficiency, but resilience and independence where that is possible and, and needed. So there is the Critical Raw Materials Act that is currently going through the legislative process. Then, of course, a lot of this also depends on our partnership with, with others on international cooperation because uh, Europe is not geologically very gifted with many with uh, with with energy sources or, or or critical minerals. We have some, and we should make good use of them. But we also need to work with reliable partners uh, globally uh, in a critical raw materials club or in some sort of cooperation with with reliable partners again to diversify. And I think the point is is really resilience. Uh, not complete self-sufficiency because we want to work with partners and we want to build strong partnerships, uh, but we need those strong partnerships to be more economically secure, to have um, to have a strategic autonomy of the European Union. So we're working on that indeed. And the other thing, sorry, I should mention that in relation to critical minerals, which is the biggest mining potential is probably in all of our drawers where we have uh, uh, smartphones that we no longer use with batteries in them. I spoke to a car producer not so long ago that told me that about 90% of the battery can be recycled and reused. And so the first place to start mining really is in, in, in the circularity of our economy and in the recycling and reuse of those products and minerals as much as possible. Interesting point. Um, just John Hughes actually was asking a question as you were speaking about over-reliance on one country for solar uh, technology or for, I presume, the materials he means in relation to um, solar technology. So I, I think you've kind of covered that. I mean, I, I presume he has in mind the Chinese situation and the fact that, you know, uh, uh, John Fitzgerald often makes the point, um, the economist John Fitzgerald, who who's, um, does a lot of work with us, that... People want low prices as well, you know. They, 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 they. They're the strategic question. They want Europe 
to um, to make its own improvements and they want Europe um, to be self-sufficient. But consumers also want good, keen prices. And if they're going to be persuaded to have solar panels on the roof of their home, they like to be able to get it at a keen price. And the Chinese, in, you know, intervention there has proven to be something uh, of value to individual consumers. So the, the challenge then is to is to see can 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 we match that in Europe and elsewhere in the world? Um, just before I ask you a final question about about the COP, which is coming up very soon, um, just a quick revisiting of the nuclear point. Dan O'Brien, who's our chief economist here at the IIEA, just a quick follow up on small modular reactors. Do you see them as a game changer, as some of their advocates do, um, or as part of the long term evolution of? nuclear energy? It's a big question, but just a couple of minutes just to revisit it if you think they, that might be a game changer, that aspect. Yes, glad glad to do that. And maybe if you allow me just a brief word, because indeed this dependency on one supplier for, for solar panels for photovoltaic is uh, is indeed of, of concern. We actually used to have a very vibrant photovoltaic manufacturing sector in Europe and, and lost that. And so we have to make sure that other industries don't go the same way. Um, and as you rightly say, there is this question of low prices, low cost. We don't want to make the transition more expensive, but there has to be a balance so that we also consider our security and the long term stability of, of markets and of reasonably priced uh, supplies. So, so really important point. As regards small modular reactors, uh, indeed, it is, I think, one of the technologies that is promising as regards the access to, to clean uh, energy, to low or to, to zero carbon energy. Um, and we've just, as I mentioned last week, had a discussion around small modular reactors and Commissioner Simpson announced the intention to go ahead on an industrial uh, partnership um, on, on small modular reactors. So it certainly is one of the technologies that we're looking at. What is the best? How do we best in, in Europe provide a, a value added for those uh, countries that would like to uh, that would like to look at small modular uh, reactors? Now, the technology is not yet deployable. So the first investments, the first actual uh, power generation facilities will only be out there in a few years. And so it's a bit early to say exactly what, how is that going to how is that going to function? But I think we need to make sure that we do what we can to make it a, a useful contribution to the energy transition and to the um, to the supply of, of clean energy. Just before we finish, Keith Flanagan from the Wholesale Electricity Policy Division here at the Department of Energy would like to acknowledge the tremendous workload of the Commission, particularly in relation to the EU response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And he says that, obviously, in his experience and that of the Department, that the Commission has been both ambitious and able to move rapidly. And all of that is to be commended, according to Keith Flanagan. Um, and I suppose it's a good point for us just to finish. Uh, we are coming up on the hour. Um, it's only two weeks um, to COP28. Um, can you say in a short minute or two what your hopes are, what your what you think the sense of ambition should be and what you where you think it will end? Do you think it will be successful? Is there a chance for it to be a successful COP? Thank you very much. And thank you very much to Keith for the very kind words of recognition that I will share with all my colleagues here who have indeed been working very hard after, over these last uh, few years. So I think, first of all, COP28 really is a decisive moment. We we can see that, and I've said it several times, but we are not on track to respect the, the 1.5 degree threshold that we have set ourselves. We have seen the the uh, dramatic weather events this summer, the summer before, uh, you've just mentioned it here today uh, as well. Um, so, so it is a situation where we absolutely need to take action. So COP28 is a really important moment for the European Union. It is critical that we manage to bring progress to reach agreement on mitigation. In the last COP, COP27 in, in Egypt, there was no real outcome on mitigation. And mitigation is necessary. Lowering our greenhouse gas emissions is, is absolutely uh, necessary. In order for that to happen, there are a number of factors that, of course, have to, to come together. Um, we need to acknowledge the challenges for many countries in the global south. We have announced uh, further financing and our engagement to work with these countries. And so I think some there are some encouraging movements, some encouraging developments out there, also in relation to loss and damage, which was the big, the big discussion at, at the last uh, COP um, about a year ago. Um, I also think that the work we are doing in the field of energy, the Global Pledge for Renewables and Energy Efficiency, the work to lower uh, methane emissions, we have some, some quite 
encouraging feedback from partners and, and a number of countries are already coming together. So I would allow myself to be at least hopeful that these early good developments on financing to help the global south, on global cooperation for mitigation, on loss and damage, on the transformation, on the on the changes that are necessary in the energy sector, that those pieces hopefully can, can come together and can help bring us to a successful outcome so that we can then focus on all the many things that will have to be done to, to make it happen, to make that change happen, including through the energy system and including in, in Europe. And the hope is also that with everything else happening in, in the world um, at the moment in these weeks, that governments will give the COP the attention that it needs. I'm sure they will, but there are so many other things happening for governments and indeed for public opinion uh, across the world that sort of one crisis seems to overtake another. But there's hardly a more critical one than the uh, question of climate and very much to be hoped that the COP28 will take We'll, we'll, we'll take the ambition forward. Um, thank you very much for being with us for this last hour, for your presentation, which, as I said, covered a lot of ground. And then the questions, which covered even even wider uh, agenda and, and set of agenda points. So thank you um, once again for being with us this afternoon. Um, I want to thank all of um, our attendees of whom there were a considerable uh, number, let me say, and for your attention and for your questions. I thank in particular um, our colleagues at the ESB for working with us at the Institute um, on this Rethink uh, series um, and uh, look forward to seeing you all again in the not too distant future afternoon. Mm -hmm.